All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Ask Us About Networking. I'm Rebecca Nelson, the Associate Director of the Career Planning and Development Center. I'm joined by Carrie Lee and John Holstey, Assistant Directors of the Career Planning and Development Center. Carrie is the Career Advisor for Students in the Walker School of Business and Technology of the School of Education and Undeclared Students. And John is the Career Advisor for the College of Arts and Sciences, Leisure Dean College of Fine Arts, and the School of Communications. And both John and Carrie are here to answer your questions today. This session is being recorded and you'll be sent an email by the end of the day tomorrow with that recording link um, and any other resources that John and Carrie uh, share during the discussion today. Um, that email will also include information about how you can connect with our office for additional assistance and that message will go to the email address associated with your handshake account. Um, so first John's going to very briefly share his top tips for networking and then we're going to use as much time as possible for you to ask your questions. So this is going to operate kind of like a Reddit ask me anything. Um, so starting now even you can begin to type your questions into the chat and then we'll run down the list and address as many of those questions as we can within the time that we have available today. So as long as the question is about building or maintaining a network, um, you should feel free to ask us anything. So if you feel like it's very basic or very advanced or very specific to you, please still ask the question. It can really be helpful um, to some of the other people that have joined us today. So we'll also have several of these sessions throughout the semester. Um, and so if there is one on um, a career development topic, um, or we're having them on a, a variety of career development topics. So if there is one uh, question that you do have that relates to one of those areas, you know, you are welcome to join us uh, at one of those future sessions, or you can always schedule an appointment with Carrie um, or John. So let's go ahead and get started with John's advice. Awesome. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you everyone for, for joining us today. I'm really excited to, to be able to speak with everyone and take your questions in just a moment. Um, before I jump into the top five tips, I think it's going to be helpful to kind of describe what we mean by networking and, and sort of operationally define what, what we're referencing when we talk about networking. Um, it really involves kind of connecting and interacting with new individuals to form professional relationships and alliances. Um, it can be helpful with, you know, expanding on your own professional uh, development opportunities and goals, but then also kind of joining with others and, and helping them achieve their uh, professional opportunities and goals as well. So it can take um, place in a number of different environments. Oftentimes people think of you know, professional conferences or industry events or community or campus events, but it's really ultimately anything that involves making uh, professional connections with others. So with that being said, let's jump into the top five tips. Um, the first tip is Establish a networking pitch or elevator pitch um, as an introduction to others in order to provide that initial information about who you are, what you do, and where you're going. So pretty much anytime you do meet someone for the first time, you're going to want to introduce yourself and, and have sort of that contextual information um, to describe, you know, who you are as a professional, what you do, um, and kind of what you're, you're looking to do in the future, maybe what um, goals you have or what skills you have, things like that. Um, a networking pitch is also called an elevator pitch, and um, you can also think about kind of providing that information in sort of a temporal form. So like kind of describing what you're doing presently, um, what you've done in the past that has led you to this point, and then what you're looking to do in the future as well. Um, so this um, resource at the CPDC has, has sort of some, some more background information about creating a networking pitch. Um, again, who you are, what you do, and where you're going. So there's a, a brief example that you can kind of take a look at um, on your own time if you're unsure of exactly how to introduce yourself or what you want to say. But I think it's ultimately um, very important to, to have an idea of what you're going to say to someone when you, you meet them for the first time. So, um, so that is the, the first tip. Um, secondly, it's beneficial to utilize opportunities to hold informational interviews with individuals within your field of interest or within your industry of interest. Um, and the benefits are really twofold. One, it gets you specific industry information um, and someone's unique perspective um, who is currently working in that industry, uh, but it also creates a new contact in that field who wasn't there before the informational interview. So if you're unsure what informational interviewing is, 
is essentially, um, it's a pretty simple topic it, uh, or idea. It's essentially the idea that you identify someone who's working in a field or in an industry or at an employer of interest and really just seeing if you can ask them some questions. Um, so you might ask them, you know, how they first got involved in that field. Uh, you might ask them um, what they would recommend for someone first looking to get established in that field. Uh, you might ask them what they do day in and day out and kind of get more information about what, what their job entails and what their experience has been like. Um, and so it's a really great opportunity to, as I mentioned, both gather that information, but then create a new contact within that field. And you may find that, you know, once you reach out to someone um, that has sort of a snowball effect and you may be describing kind of what you're interested in, um, and speaking with that person, they may say, oh, you know, I have a colleague or I have a friend who's really interested in that area and does this. Let me pass along that information or let me, let me give you um, their, um, your information as well. So it can kind of have that um, spark, that snowball effect, and you may create new contacts within that field. Um, we have this informational interviewing guide that you may want to uh, take a look at as well. As Rebecca mentioned, you'll have access to this link and, and the links um, contained here. Uh, but this informational interviewing guide contains information about, um, you know, different strategies for identifying people to hold informational interviews with, as well as potential questions you might want to ask, as well as kind of sample, um, uh, you know, emails or LinkedIn requests or phone calls for broaching that topic with um, these individuals. So you might be thinking, yeah, John, that sounds great, but how am I supposed to find someone to, to speak with? And that actually kind of leads me to my third tip, which is incorporate digital networking resources like LinkedIn, Handshake, or professional organization websites to build and maintain your professional network. Um, with professional organizations, obviously they, um, members of professional organizations are going to have similar interests to, to your own or will be affiliated in some way with that. So that may be a great place to um, start doing some research and see if there's any individuals of interest that you might want to reach out to. There may be a member directory or some articles or information about different people within that field. So that might be another way to expand your network and make some industry connections. Uh, with Handshake, there's um, the alumni and the students feature. So you can use a lot of um, different filters to find um, students or alumni with similar interests and similar backgrounds. Um, and then with LinkedIn, I wanted to quickly show this um, aspect that not everyone is, is aware of, but this is especially helpful with informational interviewing uh, because reaching out to fellow Webster alumni is um, a good way to, um, to kind of look into informational interviewing as a possibility. So on the Webster University LinkedIn um, website or uh, profile, if you click on the alumni feature, it brings up 101,000 Webster University alumni. And you can use whatever search terms you want or these pre-existing filters to narrow that down to find some pretty specific individuals within certain fields. So say you're an animation student and you want to get connected with other um, animators. Simply using that search term will reduce that number and, and provide 605 alumni and they all appear below. And then you could search um, or filter the results through all of these different um, filters. So if you wanted to speak to someone in the greater St. Louis area, you could apply that filter and you would get that information. And you can also see then where they typically work, where Webster University alumni within those fields work. Um, so that is a helpful strategy for not only um, informational interviewing, but, but just expanding your network and seeing who else um, you may want to get in contact with and who else you may want to connect with. Also within LinkedIn is the groups um, aspect. So if you were to type in animation and um, there would be a drop down option for looking at groups. So there's going to be different um, groups of people with similar interests that you might want to explore. Um, so my fourth tip is when you're connecting with other people, always consider professional etiquette. So use professional language, um, try to avoid, you know, slang or, or informal language. Um, if you're planning to meet up with someone or if you're talking about a time, try to be prompt, uh, be aware of timeliness. First impressions are really important. And um, when meeting someone for the first time, it's a, a professional contact, um, that's no exception. So um, also be aware of body language. So say you're at a professional conference and you're 
speaking with someone, but you've got your arms crossed and maybe you've got a, uh, an expression on your face that, that doesn't suggest you wanna be talking, um, be aware of your body language and, and think about that when you're, you're connecting with people um, and try to maintain you know, that positive body language. Uh, and then avoid negativity. Just as a, a general rule of thumb, it is um, in a professional sense, try to avoid speaking negatively about different people or organizations. Um, for one thing, you, you never know who that person knows or, or how that information may get around, but it's also just good practice to, to remain positive and not necessarily um, kind of go that negative route. So, um, and then finally, send follow-up notes or thank yous. Um, you know, say you hold an informational interview with someone, send them a thank you email. Um, say you met someone at a professional conference or, or something like that, send them a, a quick follow-up um, email saying, hey, it was great running into you at that conference. Um, you know, I really enjoyed our conversation about this, that, and the other. Um, I'd love to stay connected. Let me know if you have any questions or if I can help in any way. So it can be pretty short to the point, but that's kind of that maintaining your, your network aspect. You want to um, kind of reach out and, and make yourself known and, and get that line of communication open. Um, and then my final tip is consider existing uh, connections with others that may already be in place when exploring strategies for building your contact network. What I mean by that is a lot of times throughout other areas of our life, whether that's academic or work or this or that or um, whatever it may be, we may already know people who are in positions that um, to provide us with information or connect us with other individuals who would be helpful to um, to connect with professionally. So we've got this building your contact network link and within it is a graphic organizer that it can be helpful to use as sort of a brainstorming mechanism. If you kind of think about yourself in the center and go through systematically and use this to brainstorm people in your life who maybe you're not necessarily thinking about um, that might be in a position to connect you with in, um, information or connect you to individuals who uh, would be knowledgeable and would be uh, helpful to reach out to. So if you kind of work through the education system, but then um, also kind of looking at the, the community side and just thinking of all different people throughout your life, there, there may be, uh, it may uncover some information that is helpful and, and you may um, think of some different people that, that you might want to reach out to that you're already connected to in some way. So that is it for my top five tips. Before we jump into questions, I just want to check in with Carrie and Rebecca and see if there's anything you want to add or any points that, that you wanted to provide some additional clarity on. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Those were all really great points. You know, something that I think is always really important to think about is networking is really just about building relationships. You know, sometimes people kind of get scared of the term networking or feeling like, well, you know, I have to be the most impressive person, you know, at this event or, you know, make sure that everyone remembers me. And it's not so much about, you know, what you have to offer, especially if you're kind of earlier on in your career, but it's about how you're engaging with other people. You know, so if you're doing an informational interview, if you're um, meeting a speaker who maybe is coming to talk to a class that you have, you know, like, are you asking good questions? Are you listening to what they have to say? Um, are you doing a little bit of research to ask specific things that you're interested in? Because that's going to help make that positive impression on other people. Because, you know, the context that you build, these are hopefully not, you know, one point contexts, but ones that you can really build into a relationship. So, you know, maybe it's somebody that turns into a kind of mentor for you or your peers in your classes. I mean, these may be your, your colleagues down the road, right? And so sometimes it can be helpful to have that network where, you know, if I'm having an issue where like, oh, you know, we're trying to do this new type of programming in our office. I haven't done something like that, but I know somebody I know at WashU has done something similar. So why don't I reach out to that person and talk to them about their experience? So kind of keep that in mind that this is really all about just building relationships and, and being engaged in that process. Thank you both so much for sharing um, your you know, tips and framing for networking. Um, so 
for those of you who are participating, feel free to um, start throwing your questions into the chat and we will, you know, like I said at the beginning, address as many of those as possible within the time that we have today. So we have our first question. Um, I've heard that having a strong social media presence presence with your work is a really good way to get connections and expand your network. I have a few platforms set up and I'm active um, with my work, but I don't feel like I have a huge outreach. How do I get my work seen by professionals in my field? That's a, that is a fantastic question. Um, I don't know, Carrie, do you want to feel this or do you want me to? Yeah, I can start off. So, you know, I think that's great that you're already thinking about this, that you're kind of thinking about different platforms. And so, you know, I think as you're kind of contemplating, you know, what platforms you're using or what makes sense, each of those you're probably going to highlight in a different way, right? So for instance, on LinkedIn, not a lot of people do this, but there is that kind of portfolio capacity where you can include links, you can include uploads. So for instance, you know, maybe you're like a graphic design student. So you want to upload this project that you did that you're really proud of. Um, so that's something that you could share on your LinkedIn profile, or you could post an update to say, hey, you know, I'm working on this project to kind of share your work with other people or make it engaging. So say, you know, ask a question to kind of like, well, maybe this is a challenge you were running into, or, you know, I really want to learn more about this part of the design process. Does anybody have suggestions for resources, right? So it's not just saying like, here I am, um, you know, that's part of it, but how are you in engaging folks? Because, you know, how you're engaging folks on like Instagram is, is gonna look different on LinkedIn or your personal website. You know, is there a way for folks on your website to connect with you? Um, is it clear how to email you or use the um, inbox feature, right? So are there kind of calls to action for, for how you can do that? So I think that's something that I would think about is just, first of all, you know, making sure that those platforms are there, they look professional, um, and then that they're active as well. Because sometimes, you know, students might set up like a professional website because that's a class requirement and it looks great. And then they don't update anything. So then if you're, somebody's Googling you because you connected at some other point, and then you haven't updated your resume, you haven't updated any work on your website in the last year, then, you know, is that really a good use, right? So making sure that you're active and making sure that you kind of have calls for engagement, if that makes sense. And I think a really important aspect of what you mentioned is kind of seeking feedback. I think if you kind of think about who's doing what, what you'd like to be doing um, and, and, you know, Whose advice would you, would you like to, to seek out? Who's um, you know who's a leader in that field, or who's someone that you could potentially reach out to to get some of that feedback to learn more about you know the presentation of your work or the work um, itself? That's another good area to kind of look at and to think you know which you know who might be able to to provide that valuable feedback and um, and additionally like looking at professional organizations who might be aligned with what it is that you're trying to do would be a good way to kind of connect with other people who um, might, you know, find your, your, um, your social media presence and, and your work um, really engaging and, and might have some, um, some additional feedback to provide. So that's another direction. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so this next question, I think, um, could possibly mean two different things. So the question is a follow up to the LinkedIn alumni information that you shared, John. Um, so someone was asking how to join Webster University in LinkedIn. They're already a member of LinkedIn, have a personal profile. So I think there's two different answers to this question. One is Webster University's just alumni page. Um, which I don't believe you have to join, but John can show you how to get to it. And then there's also various groups in LinkedIn and there might be a Webster group as well. So John, can you kind of show us those two different things? Certainly. 
Um, yeah, and that's a great question. And I, from my understanding, you're, you're right, Rebecca, in that you don't necessarily need to follow or join anything to have access to the Webster University alumni aspect. You can actually do it with pretty much any school or, or college or institution that's out there and to use that feature. I also like to kind of think about that if there's different programs like graduate programs or doctoral programs that you're interested in, sometimes you can go to the page of that uh, institution, wherever it may be, and find alumni who have actually, um, you know, worked and or gone through that program and kind of get their, um, their perspective that way. But in order to access this, so if you were simply to go to Webster University's um, uh, LinkedIn profile, it would be right here on the alumni tab. So if you click on that, you know, that's gonna bring up the 101,000 Webster University alumni who are there. So you don't necessarily need to join anything or, or do anything really specifically to get access to that other than going to Webster University's profile um, on LinkedIn and getting to it that way. Um, you can also, I think, follow Webster University or, or like um, connect with Webster University, which is not a bad idea either, uh, but it's not um, required for you to have access to this aspect. Um, and then we were talking about the, the uh, groups. If you were, if I were to use animation again and type that in here, if you just kind of look down here, there's animation within jobs, within services, within people, but then within groups as well. So if I were interested in animation, I maybe want to kind of look into some of these different groups who are dedicated to these specific areas. Um, and so that's another way to kind of seek out different people who have that shared similar interest to, to your own um, and kind of get a feel for, you know, industry information that they may be sharing and then other uh, information that you might be uh, able to pick up along the way as well. Thank you for showing us that information. Um, and if you have other questions about LinkedIn, you know, again, put them into the chat. Um, so this next question is a really great one during this time. Um, so being a person who does best with in-person interactions, what are some um, advice that you can offer for finding opportunities for networking in this post-COVID world, especially since gatherings are not happening as much as they used to? Carrie, maybe you can so, start us off. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a couple of strategies you can take. So first of all, I would say that I think one-on-one -on -one interactions may be your best bet at this point. Um, just because you're right, a lot of people aren't having those same professional development opportunities happening or, you know, those kind of more informal networking experiences potentially that, that would come up in a, in a usual scenario. So I think like what John was talking about, doing those informational interviews, so reaching out to particular folks that you're interested in. So, you know, maybe you're trying to get into, you know, marketing and you want to learn more about different areas of marketing or you're kind of thinking about doing an internship down the road. So reaching out to contacts either through LinkedIn or, you know, your personal network. So maybe you have a family friend that works in marketing. So I think that that one-on-one -on -one is a little bit more focused and can feel, you know, a little bit more meaningful because sometimes even if there are larger networking groups that are happening on Zoom, sometimes it's just hard to interact when you're all kind of waiting for your turn to share, you know, it, it's a little bit different than some of that natural conversation flow. So I think I would really focus on the one-on-one -on -one aspect. And then the other thing is there definitely are opportunities that are still happening. So some of those are gonna be through professional organizations. So for instance, you know, the American Marketing Association um, or the American Counseling Association or whatever it is that makes sense for your area. There are professional organizations for every field and industry. And so I know for me personally, a lot of the organizations I'm involved with are doing, you know, sort of Zoom happy hours or, you know, webinar on particular topics that you could join and then have like some discussion time at the end. So there are still those opportunities. Sometimes you just have to look a little bit harder, um, you know, or, or check out the specific organization pages. And then the other piece that I would say too is, 
to utilize Handshake. So, you know, I'm guessing you all found our event through the events tab on Handshake. So obviously we post all of the CPDC events that we host, but employers can also share events too. So there are a lot of organizations that are wanting to connect with students and alumni. So they might have, you know, a session about what it's like to work at Goldman Sachs or Northwestern Mutual, you know, opportunities that are coming up at their company and you're talking about their internship programs. So definitely utilize those because a lot of students really don't. Um, you know, so that's a great opportunity for you to talk to a, a human, um, which you don't always get the chance to do that when you're just applying to everything online. So that's another really easy way to try and find um, some of those interactions. Or you can reach out to individual recruiters. So depending on how they structure their information, they can choose to share contact information on Handshake. So it might be like a careers at Boeing, you know, very general email, or they can list specific contacts. So like John Smith at Boeing. And so if you're really interested in that organization, you can reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I saw your information on Handshake, you know, can I talk to you about XYZ? So, you know, just being proactive and utilizing the resources that are already there for you. That's a, a great point that Carrie mentions about reaching out directly to employers. I think a lot of times that the fact that you're you're kind of making that that step in, in their direction, you're um, taking initiative and engaging in a conversation directly with them will have a really positive impact and, and they will um, probably be you know more appreciative of the fact that you were willing to to seek them out specifically and, and initiate that conversation. So I think that is a definitely a good strategy to use. Um, I also would think about kind of in general, what are some of those in-person opportunities you feel like you might be missing out on now? And what could some of those kind of analogous opportunities, those virtual opportunities look like? You know, Carrie mentioned there's a lot of different virtual, um, you know, happy hours or, or professional organization meetups or conferences and things like that. Um, and so looking at, you know, those types of opportunities would, would certainly be, um, be helpful. And I think it's also good to, to think, you know, is there any way that you could build skills in that area? If you, you know, aren't, don't feel super confident or comfortable, um, you know, in these virtual formats, maybe there are some things that you can do to, um, to kind of skill build in that area and, and um, do so that you can feel more confident and comfortable. Um, maybe you just don't, don't like uh, the online format, which is um, a, a possibility as well, but kind of, Figuring out like what what aspect is it that's potentially um, you know not exactly what you're looking for, and seeing if there's a way to uh, adjust that in some way to um, move forward um, in a positive way. I will also note that when we've held events like this, depending on the type of event, sometimes students start responding to each other and in the chat. And um, either that's, you know, for everyone to see um, or individually to each other. That has been something I've experienced when I've attended some, you know, professional organization, virtual conferences as well, that people are talking to each other about the content. It's bringing stuff up. And so they're just kind of having these organic conversations. And sometimes I think people, you know, overcomplicate networking. It's just talking to people. Um, and, you know, depending on who you are, that can be easy or maybe a little bit more challenging. But, um, you know, sometimes think of it as just like, oh, I had this great conversation with this person. Maybe I will just get their contact information um, and move that forward into the future. So kind of think of those things that you're not necessarily viewing as traditional networking as part of your process as well. Um, so we have a couple of questions from our next participant. So I'm going to start with the first one and then we'll get into the next. Um, so bouncing off that idea of sometimes networking being a challenge, um, they are asking for tips, tricks, or tools for introverts or shy individuals. That's wow. That's yeah, a great, great question. And, um, I think so it is a broad generalization, but um, folks with introverted preferences oftentimes have pretty specific interest areas or, or aspects um, of interest that 
they, um, they find really interesting. So I think trying to find that common link or that common denominator between your interests and you know, someone else that you might be reaching out to, um, the, the, the greater, the more you can do that, the, the greater that link is, um, the easier it's going to become to have that, that conversation. Um, so rather than just reaching out to some general person for general information, if you can get a bit more specific and find some certain aspect, um, that's going to be, that's going to make it a little more helpful. That's also why I really like the alumni feature is you've already got that Webster connection in place. So that's one aspect that, that is already there. But if there's something else for, um, you know, if there's a certain topic you want to know more about or if a certain aspect of your, your profession that you're, you're interested in talking to someone about, kind of honing in on that specific area and finding someone with that specific area um, of shared interest can be helpful for kind of overcoming that initial challenge. Yeah, and just to add on to that, John, you know, I'm certainly a little bit more introverted person myself. So everybody kind of has different aspects that they're they're more nervous or more uncomfortable about. So something that for me personally is I like that one-on-one -on -one interaction. You know, I find that to just be generally more meaningful for me than sometimes in, in normal times where, you know, you go to a conference and, oh, here's like the networking happy hour from six to seven and there's like 200 people in a room. That, that's not necessarily my most favorite type of event um, where you're kind of having to like try to find folks to talk to or, or find your little group if you don't know a lot of other people there at the conference. So, you know, I think doing things like informational interviews where it's very intentional, like John said, that there's somebody that you have an interest in, you're able to ask them questions. So sometimes that's kind of a good strategy for, for maybe thinking about smaller opportunities. And then kind of the opposite of that, sometimes that's more stressful for folks. So if you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to kind of set up a conversation, do that then, you know, things like going to, you know, employer sessions on Handshake where it might be, you know, a small group of folks. So maybe there's five students who show up to that event or maybe there's a hundred students who show up to that event. So having that kind of anonymity of, of a larger group, if you find that less stressful, but just taking some steps, you know, figuring out what is gonna work best for you and then the other thing that I think is really important is preparing. So whether that's a one-on-one, -on -one, um, but writing down questions beforehand, because if you're just like, yeah, this person seems interesting. I would love to do this job in a few years. I'm going to talk to him for 45 minutes. You know, that sometimes can be stressful. But if you have a list of questions you've written down, you have things that you know you want to talk about, it just provides direction to that conversation. And if you get off topic, they're sharing things you hadn't even thought about, that's great. You know, you can you can certainly abandon the list of prepared questions, but then if there are those awkward pauses, they they go through questions a lot quicker than you thought. You're not maybe having that fear of like, what else do I say? What do I do right now? So I think that preparation stage or, you know, if you're going to an employer group session, then thinking about, okay, what, what does the company do? Like, did, did I research them a little bit um, beforehand? So I think those are things that I would, I would think about. Um, and then finally, just sometimes it's easier to start with people you kind of know. So like John was showing that, that contact information network graphic. So you know, maybe it feels a little overwhelming to reach out to somebody through LinkedIn that you've never met before, even if they are a Webster alumni, but think about, you know, are there family friends, maybe somebody from your religious community, or maybe you are involved in volunteering with an organization. And so even if you don't know them well, but somebody else you, you both know could introduce you, sometimes that can kind of alleviate that initial stress too. Those are great points. And I actually, kind of um, jog my memory about another one that is more applicable in in-person settings. But um, sometimes, you know, if you are maybe nervous or, or not um, 
completely comfortable with it, going with a friend or, or mm -hmm. going with someone else you know to an event or something like that can sometimes be helpful as well, just to kind of, um, it makes it so that, you know, you're not doing it independently, you're not alone. You do have someone else at least there with you. Um, I know that with, you know, a former coworker of Carrie and, and mine, um, well, and Rebecca's, but uh, has very ex extroverted preferences and so, you know, if you know yourself and you know you have introverted preferences, sometimes just kind of, you know, seeing if you can go with them to kind of grease the wheel and, and get the, the conversation started, um, knowing their strengths and, and connecting with someone and leaning on your network in that way, just going with someone who you know is going to be a bit more extroverted and probably provide some introductions or, or be a bit more kind of fluid in that area. That's a good way to, to think about it too. Obviously, there aren't as many in-person situations where you can do that just yet, but just kind of keeping that in the back of your mind for in the future, if you if you do need to go with someone else, um, think about who might be a good person to, to go with. Yes, definitely um, nice to have someone to kind of lead the way for you a little bit. Um, I also kind of lean more towards that introverted side. Um, and so for those, even for those large events with 200 people or however many that Carrie was talking about. I have also in the past prepared for those by just having in the back of my mind, like a few conversation starter questions um, to help with that small talk aspect that is often really challenging for people who prefer to have like sort of more in-depth conversations and don't always um, do as well with the, the small talk. Um, especially in a large group setting. So, you know, maybe having a couple of things that you might want to bring up as far as questions for other people to get them talking. Um, and then to, um, you know, a couple of things that are going on in your field that you might want to talk about with the people at a, a large scale event. Once those large events come back, um, you, you know, that could be a tip to kind of keep you, um, keep in the back of your mind for those times that are forthcoming. Um, so next question is, how do you sell Jack and Jill of all trades um, kinds of skills as opposed to someone who might have more specific um, set of experiences and skills? Yeah, I, yeah. I would say initially, oh, sorry, Carrie. Um, oh, but I think having examples to cite and, and different things that you can provide as evidence of that, that jack of all trades. Um, you know, I was actually meeting with a student earlier who, who really prided themselves on, you know, they can do a little bit of everything. So I think being able to kind of thinking about it from the perspective of the person you might be talking to, what's going to be of interest to them and what examples can you cite that really backs up that claim that you've um, got all these different skills in all these different areas. So kind of creating that cohesive story, but also thinking like, what's gonna stand out? What, what are they maybe looking to hear or what's going to kind of pique their interest um, is, is a way to think about that. Uh, but really just being able to, again, going back to what Carrie said about preparing, really thinking ahead of time of like, what, how do you want to, to brand yourself or how do you want to um, your you know, professional self come across? And having those examples and thinking ahead of time about what you want to say um, is a good way to, to prepare for that. Um, Carrie, I know you were about to say something else. Yeah, so pretty much reading my mind, John, um, I would definitely agree. Like thinking about specific examples and how you can connect the dots between those skills that you do have and whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, so, you know, something that we talk a lot about are those transferable skills that are broadly applicable across settings. So things like communication skills, you know, teamwork, leadership, organization, that, that's important, whatever you do in life. And so sometimes for students where, you know, they have some experience, but it's not necessarily related. So maybe you worked at Kohl's, you know, for a couple of years. So that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with human resources and wanting to do that after graduation, but thinking about what is relevant to share. So, you know, maybe you had to um, take over for the assistant manager when they were out for the day, you know, like you were that person that was tapped to do that, or you helped train some new coworkers on how to do certain processes or, or do inventory, things like that. So thinking about, yeah, the content maybe isn't the same as what you're trying to do, 
but how can you talk about that in a way where you still had to work with people, you had to train them how to do things and how that would be relevant for that employer to know about. So thinking about how you can connect those pieces. Um, and then I think also considering, you know, what, what you're applying for, or what you want to do in the future, right? So some people like being very specific, having a very niche area of expertise. Some people really enjoy that generalist aspect. So going off the, the HR theme, you know, if you like doing a lot of things, thinking about what are those HR generalist roles, you know, maybe not applying to those jobs where you're only doing benefits administration, you know, it's a very specific, narrow focus of work. So if that's something where you're kind of thinking about your own skills, how that's going to fit into those opportunities you're applying for, you know, think about um, that aspect too. We still have time for a few more questions. So if you have anything else that you would want to ask of John and Carrie, feel free to, again, uh, please type that into the chat. Give a couple of minutes to see if other questions come through. I've heard kind of a question from students in the past who have felt really uncomfortable with just the concept of networking in general because they feel like I'm going to have to ask for something and I don't want to trouble people, bother people. Um, can you kind of speak to that and how um, you might look at networking um, and how you could maybe alleviate or overcome those kinds of fears? I think that's, that's a great uh, point and a great question. I think so over last week over the um, DEI conference that that Webster did, someone referred to networking as community building, which I thought was a really interesting way of thinking about it because, you know, as Rebecca mentioned before, um, ultimately it's just having a conversation with someone. It's just building a relationship in some way. So I think, you know, a lot of times people are pretty interested in, in talking about what they do for a living or, or things that are important to them. If they're invested in a certain industry or a certain job, um, they're going to be happy to, oftentimes, going to be happy to, to talk with someone about that. So I think with the asking for something aspect, um, you know, really, you can think of it in terms of you're providing an opportunity for them to, to talk um, as well. So it's not necessarily, doesn't have to be transactional. Um, and a lot of times, you know, everyone starts from somewhere. And so a lot of times people um, can kind of see that in them, themselves as well. Someone was in, in your position before they got to, um, you know, where they want to be. And so I think it's, it's completely reasonable to, to just have a conversation, build that relationship and not necessarily ask for anything in return. Um, because really what it is, is it's just a conversation. It's a, a you know, an opportunity to, to form that relationship. And sometimes, you know, you may have information or, or insight or something that is valuable to other people too. So don't, don't discount your own um, aspects that you have to, to give. So um, yeah, I don't know, Carrie, if there's more you want to add to that. Yeah, you know, I think just kind of going off of what you were saying is that, you know, it's really kind of a professional courtesy, um, you know, that I know that we all had people we talked to, you know, like when you're getting started in your career to learn more about, um, or those kind of mentor figures that you have. So a lot of people genuinely want to give back. Like sometimes folks that we've brought in for, you know, panels or events, they genuinely like to talk to students because, you know, they remember being in that position maybe a little while ago or a long time ago, but they, they like having that experience, you know, being able to interact with you and give back the way that somebody gave back to them, you know, and help point them in the right direction. So, you know, first of all, I, I would say genuinely a lot of people like talking about themselves. They like sharing their information and their expertise. And then I think it's also about, you know, how are you asking for things and how are you framing it? Because yeah, if, if I got a LinkedIn request from a random student I never met, and they said, hey, you know, you, you work at Webster. Um, do you have any jobs? Like, I'm not in charge of hiring. You know, I probably would be like, what do I 
do with this request. And so, you know, I think sometimes if folks aren't getting a lot of engagement back, sometimes it's about how you're framing things because some people just may not know what to do with it and just don't respond. And some people just have life things, you know, we all get busy. Um, so it's not necessarily a reflection on you. Um, but thinking about how are you sharing it? Because if you're approaching it more in an informational way to say, yeah, I, I really am worth, interested in working with this company, but you know, do you have some time to talk to me about you know, what, what you're doing in your role um, or like what the organizational culture is like? like that's a specific thing that I can talk about. So you know, keeping it more contained to what's the point here? What are you interested in? Um, and kind of reasonable requests. Because then if you do have that conversation, you get to know them, then they may say like, yeah, this person's really proactive. They reached out to me. They seem really competent. Like we have this internship program, you know, we, we always hire at this time of the year, like you should look into that. Um, and so that can kind of get you to that point potentially of, of an opportunity at their company, but you're not just like walking in the door asking for that. Yeah, and I, I would add, I think it's easy to, to think about these things if you're, you're somewhat nervous in terms of like worst case scenarios, but oftentimes that's not the case. More, more often than not, people are very happy to, to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times the, the worst case scenario is they simply don't respond back, which is fine. But I think you'll find that a lot of times people will respond back and, and will take that opportunity to, um, you know, provide some, some insight um, and things like that. So, yeah. Excellent. I'm going to put you guys on the spot a little bit. So <laughs> my next question is going to be asking you all to share a personal experience of maybe like a early in your careers when you were working on your degrees or even, you know, before that, where you felt like you had a networking blunder or a moment of discomfort and you know what that was like and then what you would tell yourself to um avoid that in the future it's a good question i'll, I'll think about that for a second um i'm sure my experience i'm, I'm rich with blunders but i cannot think of any at this given moment <clears throat> Um, but that is such a, <laughs> a good question. Um, I think with the, the biggest like piece of advice or thing that, that kind of sticks with me is not engaging in opportunities or not, not asking that question in the first place. And so there, I can think of examples of times that, you know, it would have been great to, you know, people visited a, a class or, or there was someone who, um, you know, had a great conversation with. That I didn't follow up with. And I think those are sort of the, the ones that they don't haunt me, but if, if we're going with that, it's those types of things that I, I just didn't take advantage of that opportunity to maintain that connection. So um, I would just be cognizant of, you know, those people that, that you do come across, maybe they don't, um, I think just maintaining that, that um, contact in some way, you know, send them a LinkedIn um, connection request or just, um, you know, Get their contact information or things like that. I can think of people I've, I've met before that I didn't stay in touch with that would be real, real helpful to to remain connected with. So I think that's my my biggest blunder is is not necessarily having um, initiated that or or maintained that connection. Yeah. So I'll I, I agree with John because I think a lot of that is just you know knowing like what's out there for you and taking advantage of those resources. Because, you know, as a student, I wasn't going to career center events all the time, you know, um, we're, we're not perfect humans either, or thinking about, you know, sometimes students, they're graduating and they're like, oh, I, you know, I hadn't ever thought to use Handshake before, you know, I got emails about it, but I never looked into it really, um, or utilized it. So taking the time to kind of figure out what are those resources, we can talk about that. Um, so a specific example for me that I think is tangentially related. So when I did my master's program, um, there are obviously on-campus jobs for graduate students too, as well as undergrads. And so I was interested in career development. And so somebody 
at the career center there um, reached out to me. And so it was a pretty small program and they're like, hey, you know, we just like to get to know the new students who are interested in career development, you know, just have like a, a quick 30 minute chat. And so great, you know, that, that's a good opportunity to learn more. And so what I hadn't really thought about is, you know, I, I dressed professionally, you know, I talked a little bit about my experiences when they asked, you know, why I was interested in the program. And then he kind of treated it as a job interview that wasn't a job interview. So I was not really prepared to, to answer some of those questions because I was going in with this mindset that like, oh, it's going to be an informal chat, learning about them more than like them interviewing me. And so I, I remember at one point, I can't remember how he phrased it, but it was essentially like, I don't know, like what's your 10 year plan or like, what are you going to do with this degree after graduation? And it, it wasn't really a hard question, but I just remember having this like blind sense of panic. And I like, and I'm sure that absolutely showed on my face and I looked like a deer in the headlights. And so I think it was, I mean, not a, a horrible impression. You know, I, I had something to say, like I said, I, I tried to approach it professionally. Um, but I just was not really thinking that was the way this, this interaction was going to happen. And so I, I ended up connecting with that person quite a lot. I actually ended up working for them down the road. So it was a good experience. I don't think that one blunder, you know, ruined my chances. Like I had a great relationship with him as my boss. Um, but, you know, I think if I had been a little bit more prepared for it, I think I maybe could have gotten hired sooner. <laughs> At that one or, or set a little bit more positive impression. So, you know, when you do kind of mess up a little bit, it's not the end of the world. You know, it's generally not things that, you know, you can't ever come back from, but I, yeah, I just wish I had been a little bit more prepped for sort of a, an interview-esque scenario, if that makes any sense. Thank you so much for sharing those stories. You guys, I know I, I put you on the spot there asking you to provide some personal information from many years ago. Um, it's hard to sometimes conjure those things up quickly, but um, in the chat, AM brought up an excellent point um, about sweat working um, versus networking. So using like physical activities and hobbies and personal interests as opportunities for networking. We've really framed this conversation in terms of some of those professional opportunities. Um, and John, I think this category is in your um, sort of uh, brainstorming web, right? Yeah, I, I think that speaks to the, the community side of things. And, and yeah, that's, you know, I, I think you're, you're right, Rebecca, we frame this in terms of the, the more kind of professional aspects of it, but really anything that involves some interaction or, or uh, relationship building um, could be considered networking to a degree. I know, you know, the, this example of, you know, the, um, uh, writers meetups and the physical activity like I'm I'm a member of a, a co-ed softball team and I know of all the different jobs that all of my my um, my teammates have and and we've kind of talked about professional aspects through that as well so it, it's not necessarily going to a conference and having that discussion but um, talking with with other people with shared interests whether that's you know physical activity or or some other element there's um, there's certainly something to be said for that and um, yeah, I think really just exploring all those different aspects of your life. So maybe it's, maybe it's not a softball team. Maybe it's, you know, a gym that you go to, or maybe it's a, you know, community event that you attend or, or something like that. So really all different aspects, um, can be thought of in terms of networking and, um, yeah, Carrie, I'm, I'm sure you have something else to add with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, that openness is really important because, you know, if you're just being an open person, um, you're kind of prepared for things as they're coming up, you, you never know when you're going to make those connections. Because I know students that I've worked with, you know, they were a waiter at a restaurant. And so they got to know those kind of regular customers that chit chat every day. And ended up getting a job opportunity from them because they knew their work ethic, they knew how they interacted with people. 
And then we're able to say like, oh yeah, you know, this is something that my company does, like here's how these things. So, you know, don't discount those opportunities, whether they're professional, personal interests. Um, I mean, I'll share something personal. So this was a few years ago now, but um, I enjoy taking dance classes. Not that I'm necessarily good at them in any way. It's just a hobby of mine. And so when I was taking a tap class, one of the other people in the group was actually um, like a dean of students at another university. And so at some point we kind of figured out that we both, you know, worked in or, you know, interested in higher ed. And so I had several really good conversations with her just about, you know, kind of things that she found helpful early on in her career um, or kind of, you know, her perspective on, on some things in, in higher ed. So, you know, I certainly was not anticipating meeting other, other student affairs folks in that way, but you never know when they come up. So I think just being open to those opportunities when they do. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm involved with music, We've had a lot of connections through past bandmates and things like that. Um, I have a friend who's, you know, um, listened to a podcast related to Harry Potter, I think. And it turned into that they have these groups that you can join online. And so she's made a ton of connections um, through, you know, a virtual space um, with people across the country. And so um, this hints towards something that in career development we call planned happenstance. Um, and so it's accepting that things happen in your life that are happenstance that you cannot plan for um, and you don't know where coming or opportunities that present themselves that you didn't necessarily think about. Um, but if you are in a space to take advantage of those conversations, to be ready to talk about your skills, to be ready to ask people questions, to be intellectually curious, then you are, um, you know, definitely it, it's setting yourself up in the best possible light to take advantage of those things that happen um, without you really trying for them to uh, to occur. So. Um, we just have a few minutes left. I'm not seeing any other questions come in. So um, I will share a little bit of information with the um, everyone here about um, the upcoming event. Um, our next web event is going to be ask us about professional attire. So if you have questions about what to wear in different situations related to, um, you know, job searching or interviewing or even just working, um, we're going to talk about that on March 17th at noon central time. All the information about that is in your handshake account. Um, and so we're looking forward to sharing that with you. I also just really want to thank you all for engaging in our chat today. You had excellent questions. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of our session, you'll be receiving an email with this recording, um, links to any of the resources that were shared, and then information about how to connect with the Career Planning and Development Center for individual assistance. And so with that, we thank you very much and hope you have an excellent rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.